Good morning. It is good to see people in the seats in the morning when I'm not doing this. For uh, all of 2021 so far, uh, on Saturday mornings, these pews have been empty, except for a couple of you. I've had some singers, and, well, and hopefully you guys have seen all that online. But uh, wow, good to have all of you here. Uh, I have to say, technically, the very first service we had in here for 2021 was yesterday. There was a wedding. Uh, Autumn Kovar uh, and Nicholas Varvel were married here yesterday, so we'll pray God's blessings on them at that time. But anyway, good to have all of you here. Welcome to those of you at home joining us still online. Glad to have you here as well. Uh, we continue to gather, of course, to receive God's gifts, and, and it is just nice to, to have everybody, uh, at least some of y'all, uh, back here in person. So let's rise, do our, our distance greeting as we get started, and we'll begin with our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Hmm. I invite you to take a moment in silence as we reflect on our sinful condition and our need for Jesus' forgiveness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us pray together. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us join together confessing our common faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. Just a, a few announcements to highlight for you. Of course, we have this announcement sheet available for you so you can read all of these in detail. Um, but a couple things. I've, again, just to reiterate what Pastor said, we're so glad to be back in person, um, to have people here. And unlike in the summer, we're not easing back into things where we just wanted to let the post-holiday surge go down a little bit. And so that means that this week we restarting youth group, Sunday school, Bible class, confirmation, all of those things. Um, so if, if that pertains to you, um, just check the schedule with your leaders because it's probably happening. That includes our Monday morning Bible study, which will be starting tomorrow morning, um, looking at the book, Joining Jesus on His Mission. Um, Bible class this morning will be led by Pastor Tyner in here. He's going to start going through the book of Romans. So everything is happening again, and we are excited. Um, Construction, obviously you can see, uh, I don't, we were talking about this in the office, I don't think any of us really um, had any idea how big the parking lot was going to be, but when you look out there now, it looks huge, and, and we are excited to see all the progress on that, so that, that's exciting going on here. Um, I did want to highlight for you, there's, there's a section on here, Youth Service Project. This is a note from the 8th grade class at Emanuel. Um, we are, I say we, I'm their teacher this year, we are working on being doers of the word and not hearers only. And so I have challenged them to finish out their time at Emmanuel by completing some service projects. And they have um, put together this project where they would like to provide some basic needs for um, some of the people experiencing homeless in our community and in Austin. And so for the next two weeks, they're going to be collecting um, some supplies you can see the list in there they wrote out for you. Um, and I will we'll have a box back here. If you can contribute to that, um, they would appreciate your support in that. Um, this is, since this is the first time we're back this year, um, offering envelopes are still available on a table back there. Your giving statements, I believe Mary is here this morning to help get those passed out to you if you've not received your 2020 giving statement yet. Um, and then finally, I'm going to invite Pastor Tyner up to give you an update on this past week's voters meeting. Good morning again. Uh, so we did have the voters meeting on um, Tuesday this week. And just wanted to update you on the things that happened there. Uh, we had three things that came forward. One was uh, to submit uh, nominations for district offices. So we had some names that we submitted there. Uh, also, there was a resolution from Synod asking each congregation to vote. Um, basically to extend uh, or to push back the synodical convention by one year, right? Every year, that happens every three years, typically. COVID, they're having all sorts of cancellations and different things, and so they've asked the congregations to say, is it okay if we push it back a year? 
So we, of course, we voted yes to support that, and so we'll see what all of the, the things happen there. The biggest one, uh, and the most exciting, was also, honestly, one of the hardest ones to, for us to deal with, and uh, the elders um, made a recommendation. Uh, we had gotten a, a call from President Newman uh, sometime in December, uh, and he had a, a young man uh, for a, a, what's known as a vicar, uh, a pastor's intern, <laughs> that he thought would be a good fit for us. So the uh, elders wrestled with that and made a recommendation to council. Council agreed, sent it to voters, and the voters did uh, vote to uh, let us pursue a vicar. And I say it was difficult simply because uh, this really is the first thing we've done publicly uh, to pursue our, our pastoral vacancy uh, since Pastor Chris is passing, and, and that's hard. Um, we, we, of course, as a congregation, still still grieve, and we understand that his family still grieves much, uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of emotion tied up in this, but uh, we believe that God has, has blessed us with this opportunity, so let me explain what a vicar is. Uh, as I said, it's a pastoral intern. Um, a, a, a guy will go through seminary, typically it's a four-year process, two years of school, one year of internship, and then back for another year of school. Uh, the young man that we're, uh, was brought to our attention uh, is going to be what's known as a deferred vicar which means that that internship happens at the end of their seminary training. So he'll have done all of his academics, come here to be, a, to be an intern here for that last year, and then the hope is, or the normal process, if everything goes well, uh, that vicarage then converts to a call. So if he comes here, and there's still some things that have to happen for that to, to, for, for, for him to be assigned here for his vicarage. But if it happens, it'll be summer of, of this year, uh, around July, August probably. He would be here through the next summer. And if all goes well, then he changes from vicar to pastor. And we have the, all the big to-do and all those things that happen. So uh, continue to pray for that process. If you have other questions, I hope I've explained it well. Um, if, but if you have other questions, reach out to me and, uh, or, or Larry Mathis, our head elder. He's been involved with the process uh, very closely as well, and hopefully we can answer any other questions. But it's a wonderful thing to be moving forward uh, and, and an exciting process to be part of. Um, you know, I really do think it aligns well with a lot of Emmanuel's values. Education is such an important part of, of Emmanuel's kind of DNA, and to have the opportunity to be a place where a, where a, where a man has it a significant part of his pastoral formation happen here. Because, again, when he comes, he'll be a student pastor, right? Um, not just but a handful of sermons probably uh, ever done or any of those other things. So it'll be exciting to be part of that formation process for him uh, if all goes well there and he comes. So, all right, with that, <clears throat> uh, we'll continue with our offering song. Again, you had your offerings plates in the back. Uh, and if you're giving, uh, if you're at home and you're giving online, and we know you can do those things as well. Uh, as we continue to support uh, our mission and ministry here. Let's continue with our offering him.
Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the giver of so many good gifts to each of us. Lord, we pray that uh, as we return this portion of our gifts to you, you would use them for the mission and ministry of this place as we continue to be courageous Jesus followers. Lord, we pray that your spirit would continue to rest upon us, that we would give back to you that portion uh, that you call us to give so that we may support and give honor to all that you do here. Lord, it is good uh, to be together again, uh, worshiping in this place. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the technology that allows us to also be there in people's homes, but uh, it is nice to be in the company of brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we, we thank you for this opportunity, and we thank you for all who are worshiping today, whether it be here in person or at home. We know, Lord, that your word is powerful and, is, and, and will continue to work wherever it is heard. We pray, Lord, that you continue to be with us as we, uh, Lord, as we proclaim the good news, as we speak the truth of all that we know in love to those around us. Lord, we ask you to, to be with so many, uh, many that need your healing. We pray for Bruce Trader, Barbara Harville, Kay Pilgrim, Dinah Aiken, Joyce Keene, Carol Etzel, Ruby Coslin, Ellen Schneider, Gilbert Prusky, Catherine Scotty, and Dana Looney. Lord, you know the needs of each, and we pray your continued presence with them. We continue to lift up those also, Lord, that deal, are dealing with COVID, uh, and Lord, with those that are continuing to recover from COVID. Uh, as, that, as we've learned, that process is long for many, and we pray your continued strength with them. We give you great thanks for all the doctors, nurses, and medical professionals, all those who continue to work so hard to bring health, healing to others. Lord, we pray for those families that grieve. We ask you to be with the family of Sophie Pompel, as you've called her home. Uh, the family of, of Amy uh, Risky Lunsford, who was a, a former uh, teacher here in, at Emmanuel many years ago. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would comfort all these, fam or all these families. We pray for the family also of Larry Yankee, uh, that you've called him home. Lord, be with all of them. Comfort them in their grief. Point them to Jesus and the hope that we have in him as they continue to strengthen each of them. Lord, we thank you for many gifts. We rejoice with Bruce and Violet Ingram as they celebrated 50 years together yesterday. We pray your continued blessings on them. For birthdays, we rejoice with Albert Marietz, James Medock, Nita Urban, Levine Kuhlman, Amanda DeRowan, uh, and any others that we know. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless them. Lord, as I ring the bell... Uh, construction begins, we continue to lift up that entire project, praying your blessings upon it as we seek to transform Lee County through your word. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless all of our efforts and the future use of these areas, uh, that they would be a blessing to you. We pray for the safety of all who work uh, in, in, in the construction of uh, these facilities and ask you to continue to bless them. Lord, we pray for our, we continue to pray for our nation and its leadership and for, for leadership around the world, that the leaders would uh, be called to your purposes, that they would be responsible to keeping people safe uh, and upholding all just laws. Lord, we pray uh, for many in our staff and, and other ministries. As we've begun uh, lifting individuals up, we, today we pray for Katie Weisert, our kindergarten teacher, and we thank you for that joyful spirit uh, that she brings to her classroom and uh, the continued energy she brings in teaching those little ones and, and uh, giving them education and, and guidance in you. We pray for Messiah Lutheran in Keller, Texas, and for the ministries there. We lift up to you St. John Lutheran in Dumas, Texas, and Redeemer by the Sea in Carlsbad, California. Lord, you know the ministries of each, and we ask you to continue to bless and be with them. Lord, as we've uh, moved forward with the vicar, Lord, we pray that you continue to guide and bless that promise, and if it be your will that all things happen as they need to, uh, that, that the vicar comes, and that would be a blessing to him and to this congregation. Lord, we pray for, for all of our ministries getting back going. We pray that you would uh, continue to rest your spirit upon your people. Lord, we pray for uh, Autumn Kovar and Nicholas Varvel, married here yesterday, that you would bless them in their life together as husband and wife. Lord, we pray for these things uh, and all other things in our hearts and mind in Jesus' name. And together now we rise as we pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. All right, our first reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols... We know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or, and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God, but we are no worse off if we do, do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, for if anyone sees that you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble." This is the word of the Lord. And please rise as you're able for this morning's gospel reading from Mark chapter 1. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And at this time, I invite the children up for a message for them. Good morning. How are you guys today? 
good. I brought some shirts with me today. I'm going to show you them. These are shirts that I wear a lot, okay? This one you're probably going to be the least familiar with. Can anybody read that word? You want to try it, David? It looks like a lini. <laughs> this is, it says Illini. This is a shirt that shows that I am a fan of the University of Illinois fighting Illini. That's the college that I was raised to root for, just like you guys are raised to root for the Aggies or the Longhorns or whatever university that probably your parents went to. You've been raised to root for them. I was raised to root for the Illini. So I have this shirt. It shows that I'm a fan of the Illini, right? It makes me part of that group. All right, this one, you might recognize something on it a little better. You recognize anything on this shirt? David? The Giddings Buffalo. Yes, the Giddings Buffalo is on this shirt. This might have been a shirt that was sold by the basketball team. Someone gave it to me. Um, I wear this shirt quite a bit. I like a long sleeves t-shirt. Um, if I'm wearing this shirt, what do people assume about me? What do they think they know about me? David? That I like the Giddings Buffaloes. They probably assume that I live in Giddings. Maybe that I have a kid that goes to one of the Giddings schools. Maybe even that I have an athlete. I hope I don't look old enough to have a high school athlete, but you never know. They, they might assume a lot of things about me just because I'm wearing this shirt with a Giddings Buffalo on it. All right. This last one, I hope we all know. Where is this a shirt for? Church. This is a shirt for our church, right? For Emmanuel with our new logo on it. When I wear this shirt, what do you think people assume about me? What do they know when I'm wearing this shirt? What's that? I like church service. I go to a church, right? They don't even have to know that I work at church. They just, if they see me wearing this shirt, they're going to say, this woman has something to do with Emmanuel Lutheran Church, right? If I'm wearing really any of these shirts, let's start with this one. If I'm wearing my getting shirt and I go to another town and I do something really mean or really silly, what are people going to think about me? What do you think? David? Yeah, that I live in another town, but are they going to think very good things about people from Giddings? If I'm wearing a Giddings shirt and I do something really mean? Probably not, right? I kind of become a representative for Giddings when I wear this shirt. How about this one? If I wear this shirt... Say I'm, um, I don't know, where should I go in town? Where's your favorite place to go in town, Ansley? What's your favorite restaurant in town? Chow tea? Whataburger? What do you like? What? You like to go with your family? If your family's going out to dinner, where do they pick? Los Patrons? Okay. So say I wear my Emmanuel shirt to Los Patrons. And while I'm there, I am really rude to my server. Do I, am I being a good representative for Emmanuel? No, right? Because they're going to see that and they're going to say, ooh, people from Emmanuel are rude. I don't want to go there. Even worse, who else am I making look bad if I'm wearing a cross on my shirt and then I am being really mean? David, who else looks bad? Not just me, not just the church. Jesus looks bad, right? 
we're all representatives of Jesus. And when we become representatives of something, we can either make Jesus look really good or really bad. And we hear that in our readings a little bit today. We hear that um, the way that we act as Christians, the kind of representatives that we are, can change the way that other people represent Jesus. The blessing for us comes in this. Jesus called us to be his representatives. He put his name on us, and he gives us the ability to be good representatives of him, to share his love and to do all of those things. And he wouldn't do that for us if we weren't worthy of having that job. We saw that in our gospel reading, right? The unclean spirits, the kind of the bad angels, they weren't lying. They knew who Jesus was, but Jesus told them to be quiet because you are not the people that I want representing me. Instead, he picks people like me and you who know that we're sinners, who know that we do things we're not supposed to do, but who find our grace, who find our love, who find our forgiveness in him, and he gives us this job of being representatives for him. So no matter what kind of shirt you're wearing, you're always wearing an invisible Jesus mark on you so that you get to be a representative wherever you go of that love that Jesus has to show to everyone in the world. Okay? All right, fold your hands. Repeat after me. Dear God, God, thank you you for making us us part of your family family and calling us us to be be your representatives. representatives. That's a big word. Help us us to always always be a good good example of of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You guys can head back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this morning I want to run some phrases by you. All right, I got four statements. I want to see if you come up with uh, uh, the common thread that runs through them. Okay, they're, they're all religious or churchy statements, so that's not the, the thread, just to give you a hint. Okay, there's something else beyond the obvious that these are are, are churchy kind of things. First one, money is the root of all evil. Okay, first statement. God never gives you more than you can handle. Second statement. Third, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And fourth, 
God helps those who help themselves. Okay, money is the root of all evil. God never gives you more than you can handle. When God closes a door, he opens a window, and God helps those who help themselves. I could go on. As I was doing the research, there's all sorts of statements that are fitting this thread, this idea that I am going with here to start, Um, but we'll stop with four. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what the common thread is with those four statements? Wait, what's that? They're wrong. Good. That's it. That's it. They're wrong, right? Now, how many of you have heard those statements before, though? How many? Well, so first, raise your hand if you've heard them. How many of you have spoken them? That's all right. You confessed, and we did, we could, we did forgiveness a second ago. Those are some pretty common statements that we hear, okay? And, and again, some of you have might even said them, but the reality is they're just not true. First, is money the root of all evil? No. Scripture tells us, and, and here's where the, it, it, I mean, it's, it's taken a, a scripture verse and twisted it. 1 Timothy 6, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay, so money in and of itself isn't bad. If, it, if, if money was evil, why do we keep asking you to give us some for church? Okay, scripture says the love of money is the root of many kinds of evil. So love of money as opposed to loving who? As opposed to loving God, right? First commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, okay? Um, Or or you shall have no other God. So so loving God is is the greatest commandment, Jesus says, okay? So trusting in the money, loving money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so, so that's where that phrase comes from. So money in and of itself, not bad. Second phrase, God never gives you more than you can handle. That's false. 1 Corinthians 10 says this. This is, again, the verse where this kind of, we believe it was drawn from. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right? This verse is a statement about God never gives you more than you can handle. When people are struggling, when people are having a hard time, we say this, and gosh, it sure is a nice feeling, or it's nice, sounds like something nice to say, okay, so that somebody can be encouraged that, gosh, you can get through this, you'll be all right. Okay? But, but it's not at all what he's talking about here in this, in this verse. He's talking about the temptations that we have will not overcome because he provides for us a way through that, okay? And the reality is that there are oftentimes things in our lives that are just overwhelming for us, that on our own we cannot handle. And instead, what does God point us to do? Not to rely on ourselves, but on who? on him. Okay, so, so yes, there's plenty that overwhelms you and knows too much for you, but as you rely on Christ, you endure. Okay, as you rely on God's strength, you endure and you will get through it. Uh, when God closes a door, he opens a window. It sounds nice. There's not even a Bible verse that this comes from. It just sounded something like somebody, I don't know, I don't know the source of it, uh, meant to be an encouragement, but the truth is sometimes God's no is just God's no. And there's no other window to go find something better at. It's just that's it. And you, you got to be content with the no that you get from God regarding whatever that may be. And finally, this last one, find, uh, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, you know, this one I think can especially lead us astray because really it is some truly awful theology. God only helps those who help themselves is, well, uh, Scripture has something completely the opposite to say. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
not to be crude, but uh, just for sake of understanding this verse a little bit more and tying it to the, to the saying, what can a dead person do? Nothing. So if you are dead in your trespasses, what can you do for your, in this case, it's talking about your salvation, what can you do for your salvation? Nothing. And so if it wasn't for God and his grace, helping someone who can't help themselves, we wouldn't be saved. Okay, so the idea that God only helps those who help themselves, just bad theology and and bad teaching. God absolutely helps those who cannot help themselves. That is how each of us has been saved because of God's rich love and mercy for each of us, okay? So why go through all these phrases this morning and debunk them? So, and you know, I mean, again, we could have gone on. I want you to listen again to the last verse of today's Deuteronomy reading. But the prophet who, okay, and this was about, um, you had this reading talking about prophets and the things they're supposed to say, and he said this in the very last verse. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. The short phrase here starts, or really gets to the idea of getting, how important it is to get what God says right. Okay, you just heard four examples of things that, that really mislead people spiritually. Okay? It says here in that verse, to speak the truth of what God says. God is, is deeply concerned that we are saying the right things. Now let me back up. So a prophet here, so it talks about a prophet who presumes to speak. A prophet in the Old Testament, if you remember, that was the one chosen by God uh, specifically to go and say a specific word of God to people. It may have been a word of encouragement. It may have been a word of warning. It may have been some condemnation, okay? Uh, and, and you think about it, you, you, know, you recognize some of the names, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, right? These are the, the books, Old Testament books of the Bible that are full of these guys saying, thus says the Lord, and then they would deliver their message, okay? And the warning was to those guys, only say what I tell you to say, don't say any more, but make sure to say everything I've said, and you only say it in God's name. And that's pretty serious. God does want us to get whatever we say about him to be correct and to speak the truth about him. Absolutely, okay? And, and it's all too often today that we, that we get this idea, well, as long as we, it kind of feels good or feels right about it, that's okay. No, God wants you to, to speak the truth, to speak what the Bible says, okay? Uh, matter of fact, today, for those of you who are going to be joining us for the Bible study, and I hope plenty of you do, uh, one of the first things it says is as you give the answer, read your Bible again. Like if it's a question about verse 1, see what verse 1 says. Don't try to guess what the teacher wants. What does the Bible say about it? We get too caught up in trying to think about some of this stuff before we, we draw from the text and then think about what the text says. It's not saying not to think. But what is the Bible saying? And then think about it and process it, okay? So, so God is serious about the things that we say and how we speak the truth. Now, this was, again, specifically written for, for prophets to speak. And as we kind of draw that to today, it does start to apply more directly to pastors. Pastor is called to speak the word rightly and to speak all of God's word to you. Not just the things that are nice and easy to say, but sometimes some of the hard things that there are to hear, okay? It means we talk about things that are uncomfortable as well as things that bring comfort to us. Um, as we do this, we, we grow in faith, seeing what God desires and seeing uh, and how, how God wants us to respond. Uh, and, and so as you hear the word then, you, by extension, grow in faith. As I speak the word rightly, as we hear this word, you grow in faith and are able to share that with others, okay? And we see that all the time in the Gospels, that as the word is shared, as Jesus interacts with people, they go out and say, look, here's what I saw. Here's what Jesus did. And you, as you hear the word, have that same opportunity. Paul does it all the time, talking about people going out and sharing and see, you know, what they've seen and what they heard, And the challenge there is, as I started to say a second ago, is that we're speaking everything, not just the parts that we like. Okay, we tend as Christians to say, all right, well, you see what the Bible says here about that. Okay, so for example, 
Today we hear the church, many in the church, talking about homosexuality and it being a sin. They'll say that all the while ignoring ideas that the Bible says about premarital sex or adultery or some other sexual sin about pornography and these kinds of things about lust. So we'll pick one sin in this neighborhood of sin and ignore all these other ones and so we don't speak the whole word. And we become hypocrites then too as we focus on just the one. People will even go so far in that kind of neighborhood of those particular topics to condone living together, saying, well, you've got to be in those relationships beforehand before you get married so that you know everything's going to be okay, and, and they're condoning sinful behavior, and you just can't do that, right? We like to pick and choose the sins that we want to focus on and, and, and make sure we let others know that they're messing up, all the while ignoring and dismissing our own can't do that. We've got to speak the whole word of God as comfortable as it may be. And there when it happens then it is something that does apply directly to us. Repent and confess and say, okay, Lord, help lead me to do right. That being said, and what's already, I'm afraid, happening in your hearts and minds as I say, we've got to start focusing on making sure we get all this right. What is our tendency when we're afraid to mess up? Well, if I'm not going to get it right, I better just I better just shut up. And that's not what God wants either. Okay? That's not what God wants either. He does not want us to be silent about his word. Okay? You could, you could be silent about it, but that's a weak response. And I, and I say it's weak because there is so much good to say. There is so much good to say. We have a tendency in ourselves to focus on that law stuff, the you should do this, you should not do that. That's our tendency when we interact with other people who are, whether they're other Christians or, or non-Christians, we tend to, go, to, tend to get very law-focused, right? And we think about all these rules because those rules will drill into us and we say, oh, you got to do this or you can't do that. And uh, we start kind of the finger wagon thing and it's just bad. And so... We also get anxious about, well, if I don't say that right, I gosh, I don't want to mess up. And pastor said today that the prophet says, God's going to say the prophet's going to die. And oof, no, I'm just going to be quiet. So we decide it's easier to not say anything. And we forget about the part that is easy to remember. We forget about the good part of what God says. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world proclaiming the gospel to all creation. Scripture tells us, go, again, let me repeat it, go into all the world proclaiming what? The gospel to all the creation. Now, we've got to talk about what is, what is gospel. I mean, gospel means good news. What is, if, if I was to ask you, what's the good news of the Bible? You've got the whole Bible to think about from Genesis to Revelation could you tell me what the good news in there is? Oh, boy. You're quite too quiet this morning. What's the good news? Jesus loves you. Right? The Bible does have all sorts of things about what you're supposed to do and not do, and those are very important. God does want us to know those things. Okay? Okay? But the Bible also says something about another thing. Well, let's back up for a second. With all those do's and don'ts, what's the consequence for us in our life? Death, right? And let me ask you, as it gets through, as it goes through and it says all these things about you do this and don't do that, by the time all those do's and don'ts are done, who is left out of any of us that has any reason to expect that they can go to heaven based on their own actions? Is there anybody left of all of us? I'm not talking about Jesus here. Is there any person that when you get through the list of do's and don'ts that's good enough to get to heaven? No. Not the people out there that we often you know, kind of wag our fingers at, but none of you either. None of you, period. 
and we get to where we see that it's each of us is left with nothing but God's mercy. And that's where the good news kicks in. It tells us that while we don't have a leg to stand on, we do have a loving and merciful God. One who, who did not overlook sin, to be sure. He doesn't overlook our sin. He can't abide the sin. He hates and despises the sin because he is almighty, all-powerful, but he is also a God that loves you. And the Bible tells you how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, so loved you that he gave his only son, that whoever believes will not perish. And we know that's the good news. That yes, there's all the do's and don'ts and none of us is righteous and holy in God's sight, but that's why he sent Jesus. Not only does he love you, but he loves each person out there. Those who hate him, he loves them. Those people out there who are doing all the wrong things that upset you and then get you frustrated, he loves them too. The difference is they don't know. What they keep hearing from people, from too many people, and often from the people like us, is how sinful they are and how God does not like the sin that they do, and that's all they hear from us. They don't know the rest of the story. They don't know that God loves them. They don't know that God forgives them in Jesus, that he's called them to turn away from their sins ultimately. And we know that's not easy. We, we throw that out kind of casual. He says don't sin anymore. Well, you still have a problem with that, by the way, right? Each of you still has a problem with turning from your sin. And if you didn't, you wouldn't be coming here each week, confessing each week that you are by nature, what? Sinful. So, so let's stop keeping just half the story to ourselves. Let's stop only telling half the story. Let's tell the whole story that, yes, I'm a sinner too. I mess up, but God still loves me. And you know what? God loves you too. And when we do this, we understand and we see that we're sinful and broken, that we need Jesus, he changes you. That whole word of God changes what happens in us. It changes us from lost, hopeless, condemned people to be redeemed children of God who are both sinner and saint. We confess as much here that I know I'm a sinful person, but I am also, because of what Jesus has done, by his grace and mercy, as you are too, a person made holy and who is loved by Jesus, who has gone to the cross to save each of you. That's the good news. That's the truth. Be full of hope. Always be ready to share that good news so that others may find the same hope that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding may it keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. <clears throat>